Against the Ropes podcast. He says he's ready. But Ortiz is a great finisher. Catches him with another left. A right hand across the jaw. He's let his fist fly. And down for a second time. It's a Ropes go. He gets up right before the count of 10. Still a long time to go. A minute 30 here in round six. Ortiz Jr. trying to pick up the defining win of his career. Let's get started. The end comes to you at two minutes, 16 seconds in round number six as our championship referee, Mark Alloy, comes in and puts a halt to this contest. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for your winner by KO, still undefeated and new WBA gold welterweight champion, the party pride of Grand Prairie. Texas, ladies and gentlemen, the phenomenal Virgil Ortiz Jr. All right, welcome back to another episode of Against the Ropes. I am Gio Garcia. I am alongside Christian Mosqueda for episode number 50. 50. 50, man. Yeah, big 5 a 5 a big, uh, big number in boxing, right? 5-0? 5-0. 5 Hashtag 50. <laughs> <laughs> 50 or 50? <laughs> Man, dude. Shout out to John Pascal, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He posted a clip on Instagram, and he saw it, and he liked it. <laughs> That's what's cool, man. He's having fun with it, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that, but, I mean, you have fun with it. You put it on the gram. Man, you become a likable person. Yes, yeah. yes. I think we had um you had an interview with uh David Benavides, right? Yeah. And that's one of the things he said. I want to turn the casual fan into a real boxing fan, yeah. right? So yeah. that was pretty cool. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um we're listening or watching the Virgil Ortiz knockout. You wanna give a quick reactions? Because we do have a lot to talk about today. All right, like quick reactions on Virgil, man. He just pretty much cemented what we saw at RGBA when we went to visit him on the work ethic that he puts in that square circle he showed on that night and just impressive uh i knew he was a little hard on himself and we'll talk a little bit about that oh, uh, really yeah he was a little hard on himself huh. at a post post uh interview we'll talk a little bit about that but uh dude i thought he looked excellent in there like seeing that sixth round how he turned up to a different gear and did what he did to relentless man just it seems right now like the sky's the limit and i know that sounds cliche but uh it is for this kid because we've seen how Composey is inside the ring as well yeah. as outside. So. No, same here. I think last week we were talking about it, right? And we were, we were saying that it's going to be a tough fight. That, yeah. you know, <clears throat> Lily and I said that it would go past the fifth, we believed. Mm -hmm. But it went to the sixth round, man. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, and I think we will have time to elaborate a little more on that because we, we are going to have a, a call in, right? Or a phone interview, whatever you want to call it. Um, have we told the people who's. We mentioned it on the gram. All right. For those you guys better be following us <laughs> <laughs> at Against Dia Ropes on Instagram. Yep. So who, who are we going to have on the line? Let the people know. We're going to have uh, a former middleweight champ. Goes by the moniker The Ghost. He's now retired, but uh, what he did in the ring, the names that he fought, big names. Uh, he was in the ring with likes of Hall of Famers like Bernard Hopkins he, uh, Antonio Tarver, yeah, Sergio like, Martinez, German Taylor, Marco Antonio Rubio. He's been in there with some big names, and so wait, did I say 
I think you said Antonio Tarver. Oh, I mean, <laughs> Jermaine Taylor. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now he's been in there with some some big names. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to have the ghost. Yeah, I think Kenny at one Pat point Lynch. he was the man he, at oh, the no, 160, yeah. man. He was the – because he was always big physically. And yeah. he had skill, man. Long we're, arms. Yeah. He was the boogeyman in a minute, like for a minute or two. Yeah, do you want to – what else are we going to talk about? Let the listeners know while I get Kelly Pavlik on the line. We are going to talk about the press conference that we attended, yes. which was the uh, the unification welterweight battle between uh, Sean Showtime Porter versus Errol the Truth Spence Jr. Mm-hmm. And on that, uh, we know that as a stacked undercard. So we also have uh, David Benavides versus Anthony Durrell. So there was a, a, some some words exchanged there. Mm-hmm. Stacked undercard with uh, John Molina Jr. He's always fan friendly. Uh, uh, style going against the equally uh, impressive in style, Josecito Lopez, and uh, we also saw another ghost at that <laughs> press conference with Robert Guerrero one. in attendance. And Looks we, a little rejuvenated, right? He does, and we we had we we did a uh, an interview with him and his and his dad. You know, those guys are always animated. You know, good yeah. good people. They had yeah they had some stories for us. Yeah, and you guys can check that out on uh, Against the Rose podcast on YouTube if you haven't checked it out already. But pretty good stuff, and more stuff coming up too. Yes. Man, uh, yeah, and we'll also talk about uh, that Andy Ruiz uh, little announcement that he made on his live about uh, hmm. not being happy with Saudi Arabia. Hmm. And if, if people who have been following have noticed that Andy Ruiz has not been promoting yeah. to Saudi Arabia on his Instagram. So he went to live and he made a little announcement, which we will tackle on and, and talk about. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about. Again, also, some, some news with Ryan Garcia, who... Uh, you know, he celebrated his 21st birthday, and so some people called out his name on that uh, Virgil Ortiz undercard. So we'll talk a little bit about about the man that called them out. So, yeah, and I think we're ready, right? We have him on the line? We do have Mr. Kelly Pavlik on the line. You want to go right. ahead and uh, introduce him? I'm going to introduce the one and only Kelly the Ghost Pavlik. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, thanks yeah, for being hey, on. Man, just keep doing the podcast, bro. Hey, <laughs> thanks for being thanks for being on here with us. Huge fans of of what you did in the sport, what you continue to do outside. Um, so let's get into it, Kelly. I know you have a podcast yourself. Yeah. Uh, you want to tell us a little about that podcast, uh, Punchline? Yeah, it's the Punchline with Kelly Pavlik and James Dominguez, and you know, um, you can find it. Go to Punchline dot live, and that goes to our website and that. You can subscribe to YouTube, um, Facebook, and Instagram through there. And it has all of our archives and, you know, past shows and everything. So it's fun. Um, you know, along with everything else that I got going on, it's just being busy, busy as hell. Yeah, and, and Ke- mm-hmm. so Kelly, when did this idea of starting a podcast, uh, we also started one a little over uh, almost a year now to the date. But when did you realize that you wanted to start a podcast? Actually, you know, my co-host, uh, Gina Dominguez, one night we were sitting there, and I, I didn't have as much stuff going on then, <laughs> and uh, he was like, yeah, man, let's do, let's do a, a podcast, and, you know, we sat down and went through it, and we didn't expect it really at all to, to kind of, like, take off the way it did. It was kind of more so, he's a, a real big with social media. I mean, mm. he's, he's on Facebook, you know, all the time, and... Um, pretty he has a good amount of followers on Facebook and you know same here so we kind of just threw it together and, and then um you know the, our format going into it was kind of different that we thought you know like most of it is um tor- towards the listeners and we go and we're unscripted and um unedited which you know you can pick up a lot of that throughout the show <laughs> but uh you know we, we interact with the the format is for the listeners and you know how like a lot of uh, podcasts people talk or even radio shows you get to hear people talk all the time and you have an opinion or you'll disagree with them but you can't really say anything or you go to call in mm-hmm. or they don't have any you know no call-ins as well as everything that we do is answering so like when you first see it and watch it it looks kind of tacky and it looks you know really low budget because our heads are down on the phones but what we're doing is reading off all the, you know, questions and answers to everybody's um, questions and um, and their opinions too. 
so that's pretty cool. Like it's just nonstop interacting with the, the listeners. And the funny part about it is, we've had Mikey Garcia, Terrence Crawford, yes. you know, uh, oh, wow. you name it, there are a lot of big uh, star guests on there. And actually, the listeners get pissed off when we have big guests like that because we're not answering their questions. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, it's crazy um, how that goes, but it's fun. It really is. It's just a little different. Yeah, that's that's something that probably they don't, they don't understand because you're getting caught up in that conversation with the Mikeys and with the Terrence, and we see these questions coming in, right? They're just coming in, so you can't answer all yeah, of them. Yeah. Terrence Crawford Mikey either. What's up with Terrence Crawford? It's funny, you know. I love our listeners, but um, yeah, we're talking with you know Terrence Crawford, and people are asking about the Tyson Fury versus Wilder, and you know all these things like that. So it's um, you know they're not even paying attention to the the interview. Yeah. <laughs> so Catley, you've been in you've been in the ring with some big, big names. We were just talking about how you destroyed uh, Jermaine Taylor the, on two outings. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Looking back at at your career, how how was your mindset going into that fight? It was uh, it was it was you know kind of cool I guess the way I put it um, and it was frustrating too. It was just like a whole bunch of different dealings involved in one. You know, for most of my career, it took me seven years and I had to make a name. Um, you know, by no means am I crying or you know complaining, but I'm just really speaking the truth on it. You know, we came up and we were just taking care of everybody. I believe at one point I was fourteen and over fourteen KOs and. And then I ended up being like 21 and 0 with 20 knockouts or somewhere around that. Anyway, long story short, was just dismantling uh, fighters and, and dangerous fighters. Even when I fought for the NABF title, I fought a guy by the name of Fenucio Zuniga who was signed by top rank. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously you can fight if you're signed by top rank. He was 17 yeah. and 1 with 16 knockouts. So there was a guy I fought that a lot of people didn't want to fight, um, especially at the time when I fought him. And uh, we just had a long road, and we still couldn't get no breaks. I mean, you know, here and there, we were kind of like swing bouts on ESPN2. Um, and most of the guys were getting big shots. And, you know, I fought the Olympic trials with her, you know, on the Olympic team and getting world titles in 2005. And here, seven years later, for me, you know, I had a breakthrough with uh, tough, rugged Jose Luis Archie, another one that a lot of prospects weren't fighting or taking their chance with. Um, I beat him. I fought Edison Moran. And actually, his Artucci was for the WBC Eliminator mm-hmm. and mandatory. So after I beat Artucci, I'm thinking my next fight is against Jermaine Taylor. Mm-hmm. And then I got a phone call two days later going, hey, Cal, for my agent. You know, he goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, good win, but uh, yeah, you got to fight Edison Moran the next. Mm. So I fought two WBC Eliminators. I just uh, lost fighter in boxing at that point and then um you know finally we had the opportunity with your man mm-hmm. and that was uh huge those are two fights in 2007 right before you finally met jermaine taylor later that year oh, in I, september yeah two, yeah it was our two and Miranda. Mm-hmm. and uh up until that point uh jermaine taylor well he was the wbc champion at the time you fought this fight in uh, atlanta city hall tell me a little bit about taking those first steps climbing up that ring you know, and, and you knew that this was your chance to become a world champion. Yeah, you know, like all the work, as, as I was mentioned, you know, seven years that took to get that, those opportunities and that break. And, you know, in boxing, that window is only, it's only open for a short period of time. And, you know, that was all going through my head. You know, the nerves, everything is crazy how fast the brain <laughs> works. But, um, yeah, everything was going through there. And I was just, you know, trying to go over the game plan and what we worked on in training. But for the most part, the nerves takes over, mm-hmm. and you just kind of are you're soaking it up. But at the same time, you're just trying to keep your composure as much as possible. And, you know, you're going into that. But once that first bell rings, you know, it's all business and everything's gone. And then you start, everything slows down a little bit. So, Are there ever moments where you, you that doubt creeps in? Because we all, we're all human. We all have fears. Does that ever happen where... Uh, you start to self-doubt or those fears creep in, and what do you do to to combat those and to, to minimize those things? Absolutely. I, I could tell you this right now, and, you know, most people will tell me, as always, they say I'm crazy and I don't know what I'm talking about, but I can guarantee you that 99% of fighters and they have those, they think about the, you know, worst things that could happen. 
you know, because it's not that they're not human. And so if any player ever says that, I don't believe them. I think they're full of shit. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and that's just being honest. Yeah, I did. You know, you play, especially like the night before. Usually, then it's crazy for me. I was laying out the entire fight, and I was just picturing, you know, everything. Like the smell of the gloves getting hit, you know, the reaction, how you're breaking down from what I watched on film with this guy. And then, of course, you get the negatives of like, like what could happen? What's the worst that could happen? You start thinking like, man, what if I wake up and I get to the locker room and I got to ask him who won? You know what I mean? <laughs> and I start thinking like, all oh, those are, if he catches me, you know, yeah, you think about that. You, you do have to put that. I think that you should. I think that you need to humble yourself and, and be realistic because it's boxing and that can happen no matter who you are. And for an example, Jermaine Taylor, the first fight, mm -hmm. I got dropped in the second mm -hmm. round. Yeah. No, nobody wants to get dropped. I mean, a couple years later down the line, I mean, that made the fight what it was and one of the top middleweight fights of all time. But for like a couple weeks after, I don't want to talk about it or brag about it, getting off the canvas to knock Jermaine out. I, I want to stick my chest down and say, I didn't get knocked down, and I beat him. Mm -hmm. So that shit happens in a fight. You know what I mean? Like, you get dropped and you got it, so you have to play those. But I got up to go on to win the world title, and you know, that's the way it goes. And sometimes, you know, maybe, I don't know if it was the case, but preparing myself for situations like that, um, you know, a couple of days before, the night before, in the locker room, who knows? Mm -hmm. That moment when you get dropped, how how hurt are you, and how how long does it take to get your bearings to, to get back into this, this this world championship fight? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, being hurt, I wasn't hurt, like, I wasn't foggy. You know, sometimes there's different knockdowns, and mine was equilibrium, and mm -hmm. equilibrium takes the weight away, the, the balance, and... Uh, you know, that, that was definitely it. Like, I could, when I got dropped, I could hear everybody screaming. I could actually pinpoint who, who was saying something. So I was there. It was just like my, my legs were gone. You know, they were all over the place. A lot of people talk about the fight being stopped, but, you know, Steve Smoker clearly stated in the locker room, if you could show me that you you know what you're doing in there and you're trying to hold on or you're, you're doing something to grab and, and keep yourself protected, I'm not going to stop the fight. Hmm. Now, granted, I was, uh, I flopped around one time and it was, you know, <laughs> balance and everything. But if you go back and watch the fight, you know, I turn around, I grab him, I, you know, bear hug him. Mm -hmm. And then even from there, I start hitting the body, I'm throwing punches during the clinch. So, yeah, mentally I was there, it was just the legs were gone. But um, at the, after the second round, I went back to the corner and my trainer was hollering at me and I'm like, you know, giggling and laughing and telling him I'm all right. When I went out there in the third round, I think I threw 90, 98 or 99 punches in the third round. But I knew halfway through that round that I had that fight won. It was almost like I, you know, zapped the soul out of him because of the amount of punches I was throwing after he just spent all that energy and he didn't knock me out. Yeah, and in the seventh round, you're not normally known for speed, but you, you're known for your length and your power. In that seventh round, you deliver a barrage of punches that – becomes a highlight reel when you knock out Jermaine Taylor. Tell me that moment and and the feeling right after you're announced as the winner. Yeah, you know, when they say I'm not known for the speed, but you have to have the speed to hit somebody, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I hit him, I knew he was starting, I could see the twitch, you know, in his chest, and uh, when he went back into the corner, I, I just you know, I hit him with a shot, and he was hurt, and then I hit him with a hook that when you watch the replay, it's hard to see, but I remember it live, actually, hitting him with that, and I just see him, you know, slope it to the corner and go down. And, you know, it's, again, another situation where it's just crazy, like, everything that goes through the head and how fast it's going. You're excited, you know you're happy, but you really don't know what the hell you're happy about. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, it has not sunk in, and you don't know exactly what you just accomplished. Mm. And it's crazy. And it didn't take me to man, months later, I bought past my mantle with trophies and the world titles and the, um, everything up there. And, you know, you still don't grasp what you did until after a period of time. Yeah. So after that, you defeat him once again, and, and you're on a high. But as we know, the sport of boxing, there's highs and there's lows. Uh, your next uh, opponent, you take care of business with 
Gary Lockett, and then you have this this chance to to fight a, a future Hall of Famer and Bernard Hopkins, a fight that you were heavily favored. A lot of people thought Bernard was, was over the hill. And so can you tell me a little bit about how it was uh, facing uh, Bernard Hopkins and what you learned from, from this experience? Yeah, you know, the Hopkins fight was a fight that we were kind of in a kind of tough situation. You know, I think I believe the Paul Williams fight that we were in negotiations with fell through. And, uh, and, you know, and obviously I wanted the Paul Williams fight. I love Paul I thought he was a great fighter. But I wanted to fight a guy like him coming up who really mm. wasn't a big power puncher and, and mm. coming up from a lower weight class. I would love that fight. Um, he threw a lot of punches, but so did I, and I had power. And that fight fell through, and, and I know that I just came on fighting Gary Lockett. And if I would have fought another Gary Lockett type opponent, I would have really took a lashing from you know the, the fans mm. and the media mm. and everything else. We were kind of in a pickle on that, and the opportunity, you know, they threw out Bernard Hopkins. And I, no matter what I said, I, I got to fight him. In my mind, I'm saying, to keep, get to keep the respect and everything, I got to fight Bernard Hopkins, even two weight classes above, you mm. know, and, and which we, we did fight. And, um, you know, it just it, it wasn't my night. I mean, there's a lot of silly things that were going on in this mm-hmm. you know, as far as, you know, health-wise, being sick and everything. But, but I never said anything because the only thing that does is just bring people to come down and say, oh, excuse, excuse. But mm-hmm. you know, Thomas Hauser, who's a, a notorious writer, worked with New York Times, and he's really straightforward. He wrote a, a book on it. He was in a locker room before the fight. But, uh, you know, overall, to fight a guy like Bernard Hopkins, <clears throat> he is everything they say. I mean, he, he's smart. He knows everything. Everything he does is because he, he has a game plan behind it. Every jab, every move, the way he moves around the ring. You know, I told somebody on my podcast actually that the best foot, the other way to do the best footwork, you got to be flash. Maybe you got to be like Pernell Whitaker or mm. the late great Pernell Whitaker or guys like that. And sometimes a lot of these guys make great moves, but they're out of position. As you, know, you get guys like Mike Garcia, Bernard Hopkins. Um, Bernard didn't. You know, he wasn't flashing with his feet, but Bernard had great footwork because inches and angles. He'd make that one step, that one move at the right time mm. to deflate your punch or to get himself in position or to step in and grab you to the punch right you. Um, he definitely is a tactician in that ring. So. Nice. All right, Kelly, I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, Gio Garcia, who has a couple questions for you as well. Yeah, so just continuing on from that, after that you fight Marco Antonio Rubio, right, and Miguel Espino at your hometown, right, Youngston, Ohio. Shout out, Youngston. <laughs> yeah, shout out to all the people from Ohio. How How is that? Let me start off with that. How is that fighting in your hometown in front of your people? That was awesome, especially to Rubio. I mean, we did a split, um, split review with Miguel Cotto. And, you know, I think that was one of the first time or second time that that was done where Miguel Cotto fought in New York and I was in Youngstown. And uh, it, it was cool. And Rubio, you know, dangerous opponent. And, you know, uh, he really wasn't a top guy until after I beat him. He went on a huge winning streak and knocked out Lemieux and I believe he won a real title. But um, that was, that was a, you know, a dangerous fight to take out of there in front of the hometown. Uh, crowd, you know, especially coming off a loss, and uh, you know, we came in, we shined, and that fight was actually, you know, I made that a, a really easy fight. And then, you know, the Spino was another one because at that point, Spino came in, there wasn't other options out there either, and we wanted to stay active, you know, after that. And it looked great against um, Rubio, so we stayed in and against the Spino. He was a durable opponent, I wouldn't say he was one of the top guys to fight at the time. And then we went to the uh, Martinez fight. So, and, you know, the Martinez fight, that was another issue of, if you could go back and do it over again, yeah, I probably would have. Um, I probably would have took, you know, came in the pound heavy, everybody else does it anymore. So, yeah. came in, you know, it was, my, it was my last fight at middleweight anyways, take, you know, so, shoot me up the belts, what do I care? Um, that fight came down, That that was a fight that, what we did to try to make weight. I mean, even the announcers or commentators mentioned during the fight, you know, about my weight issues and 
the stationary bikes and stuff like that in the hotel room. And, um, you know, but again, I didn't talk too much on that. I didn't bring it up too much because at that point, especially during the career, you take a lashing for that. You know, I can talk about it now because yeah. I've been retired seven years and I'm probably not ever going to fit again. So it don't matter now. Um, but, you know, I, I could go back and say, like, I'm not disappointed or, or pissed off of my career. I mean, I had two losses with 40 wins and two of the losses or, or two, two all-time greats. Mm-hmm. And there's no shame in that. And I could honestly say that those, I was not even at 80% Kelly that night in the ring. But um, I don't take any away from Bernard or, you know, you know them guys are, are unbelievable fighters. And then Bernard probably, in my opinion, the best middleweight of all time. And um, so there's, there, there's no, uh, I have no shame in it, though. No, definitely, yeah. You know, I wanted to ask specifically about the Sergio Martinez fight. You know, and I hate to say it because you're on the phone, but he was, I think he was my favorite boxer at the time. Um, <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> hey, my good friend, Roger Romo, that was his favorite, too. Yeah. So I went out to California and became you know, close with Roger Romo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the first half of the fight, it seemed like you were a little too much for him. You were overpowering him. You you had a size, you know, the size difference there. Um, it just seemed like your skill and your power was a little too much, but he, it seemed like he just caught a second win in that second half. Um, and it's one of my favorite boxing fights of all time. So can you talk a little bit about, you talked a little bit about what happened before, right? So can you just elaborate on that? And then can you talk about what happened, you know, before, during, and then after that, that fight against uh, Sergio Martinez? Yeah, you know, that's how I started off. Getting to the fight, you know, he, he was up, he was moving. And I would say the first two rounds, uh, I think he won. Some people would say the third round. You know, and I was just paying attention and trying to just fill him out. Um, I don't think he tired in the middle rounds. I think because we know Sergio Martinez is in great shape, so he wasn't going to tire. Probably if he was, it would have been around the seventh, eighth round. Um, but I just caught on quick to his, his style. I mean, it was the sides. Yes, um, it was me making the moves, you know, cutting off the ring. And people say I couldn't cut off the ring, but obviously I showed that I could. Um, you know, I dropped him. I thought all this time that that was just a quick little off balance punch. But from what Sergio, I guess he just doesn't really talk about it. You know, my partner that he was hurt. He told Roger Romo that he was definitely hurt. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. <laughs> But um, no matter what, I, I was ahead. I was up on the scorecard. And then I believe it was the last round. A lot of people blamed the cut man and my cut, you know, on why I got beaten that last round. I could honestly say those last couple rounds. And I could honestly come on and say that if I was cut or not, that I was going to lose those last couple rounds. Wow. I hit the wall. I, uh, that's why I got cut so bad. And that's why the ble- uh, bleeding was so bad um, from the dehydration and rehydration this day. The whole, um, the whole thing behind it was bad. Yeah, and then ninth round, you know, I just I, I missed with the punch, and I was just kind of like stuck. And he just flicked out a little jab, and that's when it cut me. But um, no, there was nothing I could have done. Uh, I, I was not tired like a lot of guys. You know, my breathing that well, wasn't the issue. It was just like quicksand. And yeah. you know, and he, he capitalized on it. So that's another thing with you know, even the Hopkins and Sergio. I mean. There's situations where I was ahead enough, and I could have, if I could have won one more round or two more rounds, that's a close fight. I still had that Sergio of Martinez fight, fairly close. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, he definitely won, and he beat the snot out of me the last couple of rounds. <laughs> but uh, if I don't, beat the snot out of me for 12 rounds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's um, that, that was the, the situation. So, yeah, even with the cut, there was nothing I could do in the later rounds. Like I said, I hit the wall, and... Uh, he capitalized on that. And right. I think in that fight, you know, where, like I said, if I, if I just vacated and said, you know what, strip me, whatever, um, you know, I think that, that one pound or a pound and a half, if I came in, I think that makes a big difference because you're talking about a matter of being dried out and dehydrated for a whole day and you're talking about six, seven hours trying to get those last three, you know, three or two pounds, two and a half pounds off. That makes a big difference. Yeah. So, 
like I said, that was one of my favorite fights. I can watch it over and over. Um, you know, I think you gained the respect of a lot of fans, e even though, you know, you lost the fight. But like you said, it was a close fight. But what happens after that fight? What do you, what do you, you just got your second loss? What do you tell yourself? Nothing. You know, people, um, they ruined me, you know, and it didn't. Because like I said, I came back and, and not only beat a rugged, tough Rubio who went on, you know, to show, you know, his, his worth a couple years after. Um, yeah, so it wasn't the fact that I, I would have went to the Rubio fight show. I would have went to all these other fights. I would have got white marks by Sergio Martinez if that was the case. Um, it didn't. You know, I didn't get dropped. I didn't get hurt bad in, in none of the fights. You know what I mean? Uh, buckled or anything. Um after the Martinez fight, it was kind of like, I always knew why I lost. You know what I mean? I think it would have actually been worse. You know, sometimes people say, if you go in and get a girl and you lose, you won't feel as bad. If I would have went in and gave him my all and lost, I probably would have felt worse. Like, yeah, he's better than me. You know, nobody, cause nobody likes that. And um, I know the whole thing. I knew, I knew if I was 90%, the fights are totally different. I mean, you're talking about a, a big difference in the fights. So that, that wasn't it, you know. But after the, um, the Martinez fight, I went in, I, you know, we went back up to, because of the weight issue, went up to uh, and fought Alfonso Lopez at, you know, 170 and a catch weight. And um, went to that fight, wasn't, wasn't really prepared, didn't find out who I was really fighting. Um, didn't even know what we got in the fight in that 170. It was kind of like a quick throw-together throw fight. And then, after that, you know, that's where the, the relationship went at home. So, um, from there, we, you know, we made the move with uh, Robert Garcia. Yeah, so, no, I, I think it's refreshing to, to listen to that because you, a lot of guys make excuses, right? A lot of the guys say, oh, it was a close fight. I thought I won, but I think you're able to say, I know why I lost, and I know yeah. I possibly wasn't. I don't have to be delusional to think that I won, you know, either one of them fights. Again, like I said, Martinez, you know, gave him, I had to keep one by three rounds, you know, which yeah. is, is a good amount still, you know, it's definitely, clearly he, he won, but, uh, you know, it was closer, obviously, than a Hopkins fight, too, so, um, yeah, it is. But you have to, you know, like I said, you know, I, and I did beat myself. Everybody thought I did. I did beat myself up over it. Um, you know, the switch with Garcia, that really came down to, that was a lot with top rank. You know, top rank really wanted that. Top rank wanted me, they wanted me gone from the beginning of my career. You know, and I fought and fought and fought to beat my, my trainer, Jack, and, um, you know, 2001, 2005, they sent me out there to resign. With uh, with them and you know try to talk to me as a new trainer and and uh, and Top Rank's a phenomenal promotional group you know I'm glad I stayed with them and I, and I was with Top Rank but the move with Garcia was kind of it was at that point of the career like um, you're 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 getting older you know um, yeah fought the top guys we know what you need to work on and so how Top Rank thought is like if you don't try to do some change this is what's going to keep happening. You know, or we're going to be done with you. And it kind of came down to a point of they were going to probably uh, freeze me if I didn't make the move. So we did. And then there was a couple of things, you know, I canceled the fight in Youngstown. And a lot of people, of course, the first assumption on that is he's out and he's crazy. He's, uh, he's not going around and he's doing this and he's doing that. And that wasn't the case. You know, the case on that was there was a fight being made. I was supposed to fight back in Youngstown again. And, uh, you know, they were putting me in against a guy by the name of Daryl Cunningham. And uh, the fight for training camp started. And usually at the beginning of training camp, I had a fight contract. Well, we get, long story short, we get all the way up to like three weeks before the fight. Here, you know, my trainer is promoting the card with top rank. And his uh, kid is uh, doing programs, this, that. And people can lie all they want, but, you know, we know the truth. Me, my agent. Cameron Duncan, my dad, and I didn't get the, the fight contract till like a week or a week and a half before the fight, and the, the amount of that I was getting paid was really a smack in the face, 
and my trainer, nobody told me about the fight contract and, and feared that I would back out of the fight, you know, and they would lose out on the promotional part and things like that. So that was, you know, the reason. And I, and I think that I, uh, me and Jack, I love Jack. You know, me and him had such a great career together and a long run. And I think Jack's a, a great guy, and I can understand the point for him better. You know, if we make a couple extra bucks. But I think it was more so just the way it all unfolded, and, and I didn't find out. But of course, I was, you know, I, I took the, the beating for it, the lashing for it. And as were any other fighter would have done the same thing, you know. Um, I wasn't an opponent. I, I was a guy who only had two losses, and they were to Sergio yeah. Martinez and Bernard Hopkins. And then, you know, they were going to hold out on giving me a fight contract in my hometown. And then the amount that I was getting paid, it was uh, everything behind it. So that, that was kind of the situation there of why I pulled out of that fight. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was like the big stink. And everything that, like, really hit for a while about me pulling out and canceling the fight. So close to the fight. Mm-hmm. But nobody got the true story of you know, why that happened. Let me ask you this, Kelly. Do you feel overlooked? Because I feel like at, at one point you were the man at 160. But for some, like, people don't talk about you like they talk about, let's say, the two guys you mentioned, right, Hopkins or, or Martinez. Oh. Hopkins, obviously, like, probably, like you said, the best middleweight ever, right? Mm-hmm. But do you feel like you're a little bit overlooked? You broke up there for a little bit. You mean just as far as, like, today, you know, after my career and everything? Yeah, do you feel like you're overlooked in, in those terms? Like, because you were the man at one point at 160. Yeah. But maybe you didn't have that notoriety, you know, now. People don't, a lot of people I feel like don't look back and say, wow, Pavlik was the man, even though you probably yeah. were at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And again, my goal, I'm a realistic person. When I turn pro, yeah, my goal was to win a world title. And realistically, did I think I was going to win it? I had no idea. You know, I was truly worried about fight to fight to fight. You know, like, one fight at a time. Um, when I won the world title, it was like, damn. But after I won the world title, that was another thing. You know, retired. Of course, all the stories, like, yeah, you retired a little early. And what a waste of career. And you could have done this. And it's almost like people just think that my career started in 2007, you know, when I won the world title, yeah. and ended in 2012, you know, no, I started in 2000, you know, I, I was pro that long, I had 42 pro fights, um, you know, when I won the world title, I was one of the guys like Robert Garcia, who retired really young, you know, just the person who did not, you know, I started counting down after the title to retirement, where mm-hmm. most guys would be counting next big fights, so, as far as my career, you know, I look at it, I don't get the credit for, you know, around it now, all these years, 13, 12 years later, he was sucked. He was overrated. But, you know, at the time, until I beat him, he was Godzilla. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Jermaine Taylor, uh, deeper than Rockers twice. And Jermaine Taylor had tough fights with very awkward guys. You know, Umar, uh, Winky Wright. Yeah. Guys that gave everybody fits. And he didn't get beat by him. No matter how bad people want to say, even the Hopkins fights when he won, people say that Hopkins got robbed. That wasn't a robbery. You know, if you thought Hopkins won, absolutely. I, I, you're not crazy for that. But to say he won, that yeah. was not going to work either way. But Jermaine made those fights that close. Ricky Wright went in and beat a lot of people. And it was only a couple, not even a couple of years before Jermaine fought him. Ricky makes people look bad. Um, but Jermaine still came out, like you said in the countdown, before I thought of him. But I'm still a winner, though. Um, I beat him. That's nothing. You know, um, I beat, you know, I was the first person to start Bronco McCart. I know it sounds crazy. It's Bronco McCart, but nobody did to Bronco what I did. Um, you know, just all them guys, nobody did to Jermaine what I did. I was the first to do it. Jermaine Taylor went in after being beaten by me like that, beat twice, and fought Carl French. And nobody said anything about this, mm-hmm. but Jermaine's a boxing lesson for 12 rounds. The second fight with me and Jermaine, I outboxed him. Jermaine goes in a weight class up and, and, you know, in my opinion, so far hit on a scorecard that he could have he took uh, another knee. 
Kelly, is this Christian? Uh, again, um, Kelly, I have a question. Um, we we normally talk about um, maybe the the battles I have in the ring, but we also know uh, as people we have battles outside the ring. Um, can you tell me uh, uh, maybe a moment or maybe an, an obstacle or something that you dealt with outside of, of the ropes? And uh, tell us a, a little bit about that and how you deal with that outside oh, of the you're talking about, you know, with like the drinking and everything? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, there's, you're not going to make no excuse on it. I'm just going to be straight on it. Um, I, I lived a little too much. You know what I mean? I could admit to that. Um, I went out and had fun. Uh, and as far as affecting my career, I don't think it did at all. I'm mean, just being honest. Um, I think if I would have kept going the route that I was going, and if I was fighting, absolutely. You know, But I always did have a cutoff. And I know people are going to say, well, but when you're putting your body out of training, you know, affects when you get back into training. Mm. And, and it does, but I, I had to cut off when I hit training camp. I trained my ass off, you know. Um, and you can see every fight. I mean, I think I was a little weight that average. Um, not only my knockout ratio was one of the highest, but punches per round that I threw. Mm. But outside, yeah, you got to a point. You know, being in Youngstown, there's a lot of things too on that. You know, there's just a little trouble. And to this day, I, I just think it, it was petty shit. Like, you never heard me getting busted with, you know, 70 grams of crack or coke or drugs or, or even marijuana. <laughs> you know, you never heard me with, like, a silly weapon. I mean, let's be honest. I got in trouble for shooting a 41-year-old girl like with a BB gun, um, a four-wheeler, mm. and, and a shoving match of mosh pitting at a rock concert with my buddy mm. you know what i mean uh, was, those were the type of things that i really got in trouble for if it was anybody else those were never been news mm. you know but again knowing the situation and the spotlight that i'm in i think i made bad decisions doing that and you know i do take blame for that i acted childish immature and i let the fun having fun i was living like a rock star Mm -hmm. more so you know and um that was that's what i could say about it and after i retired you know it kind of that that like the first three years it was still like that you know i was still caught up in that that lifestyle and finally you know it just took the the beauty down incident for me to sit back and say you know what this shit's got to change. Mm -hmm. You know, I got kids. I got, um, I, I am retired. I do, I, I have a good amount of money in the bank where I'm, I can live the rest of my life and make investments and, and do things that I want to do. And I have world titles sitting in my trophy case that not a lot of people say they have. I got beautiful kids. Tell you got to pull your head out of your ass and, you know, become a, a man now. And uh, that's what I did, you know, for three and a half years now. And I have, you know, I have now. I got a podcast. I'm running a um, combine for kids from fifth to twelfth grade. We teamed up with Adidas, um, Papa John's, and we got this local company, a new company. And these combines are going to be great. The boxing gym's going to open in, you know, two months. So nice. Now I, you know, I cut the shit and got on track. And you know, becoming a man like being a world champion and being the person that uh, people want you to be. And, that, and there's a lot of pressure with that, you know, and I do have a lot of animosity to this day with that. But mm. same time, that's the way it is. And you got to be that person. I got to be that person for my kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's about that time. So, yeah, I did. I had to deal with that. And, you know, for as much of it that I think was bull crap, um, it is what it is. But I still put my 
I, at the end of the day, I still put myself in a lot of situations. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there ain't nobody to blame for that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to, like I said, pull my head out of my ass and get back on track. Kelly, I saw that on your Instagram you have an anti-bullying uh, a message as your uh, as your as your picture. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Where did, where did that come about, and uh, what what message are you trying to put out there? Yeah, you know that come about. You know, that's bad anymore, and I think the worst is the same. Um, you know, I got two kids, and my my kids are they all. I'm, I'm the type of dad that when something goes on, I ask what they did first. You know, like what do they do? Because, you know, every parent, most of most parents are always like, hey, my kid wouldn't do that. But, so good where that's going is, my kids don't have social media. Mm. You know, they're 13 and 10. Now, I'm not knocking anybody that has lets their kids get on there at that age. I, in my opinion, though, how I feel is, they're too young. You mm. know, social media is for adults. There, it truly is. And, you know, it's for people that are mature enough to be on there. And I don't think my kids should be subject to some of the shit that's out there, especially in 2019, mm-hmm. how crazy yeah. the world is right now. So, hey, listen, you want to talk to your friends, you got a phone. Um, I didn't have a phone. I I think I stole my brother's pager when I was their age, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then, so, like, what, what, why do we need social media? Like, see your friends all summer long. Mm-hmm. They're going to be in school with them, especially when school starts. The problem is with the cyber bully, back in the day, it, if you got bull, a bully at school, it happened at school. Yeah. And the kids in your classroom knew about it, and eventually you got tired of the shit, you know, you stood up. Mm-hmm. Today, you know, this uh-huh. kid's friends with, with 20 kids from this other school that's a couple blocks down the road, and they're friends with uh, a bunch of kids from this other school that's in the same county. So when you get one kid from the school now, it's not the kids in the classroom anymore. It's the entire area, you know, Tri County area or whatnot, that, and all these people are on there just picking and picking and picking. That's worse. And that's where these kids really get, you know, they they are committing suicide or they're just fed up and they had enough. So yeah, the bully. I think you know more kids need to stand up mm-hmm. and defend themselves, and uh, more parents have to get involved. Listen, if your kid has social media, that's cool. Don't tell me that you don't check it either because you trust them. If you're going to let your kids have social media, you should be in their shit all the time. Mm-hmm. Checking on who, just because you have crazy people out there, who's who's inboxing them? Who are they inboxing? What are they posting? Mm-hmm. You know, another thing is with these kids, you put something on that internet, it's on there for life. You know, mm-hmm. um, they don't understand that. So I think the parents really need to get more involved with the kids and the social media. Yeah, and no. I think that, you know, somewhere along the line, you got to put it into the, to the bullying. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think you're, you're, you're doing something good with it, with this. Yes. It's a, a lot, of my, a lot of people might think, uh, oh, you're being too controlling, but yeah, now, like you said, at this, this day and age, uh, with social media, with, uh, with people expressing their opinions and yeah. being able to be, an, uh, at times Listen, anonymous. I, I, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not controlling with that. You know, like I said, you know, what there is because I agree when you can control kids build resentment. Oh my God, so my kids, you know, they're not, they don't sit in the house with, with their hands folded and, and legs folded like in an upright position. I'm not shit like that. My kids go, my kids are going to have fun all summer long mm-hmm. and they're out and about and they have sleepovers and they sleep over and, and they're allowed to have phones and, and do that. Like, I'm not even going to sit on their time on school nights and they, they're on their honor roll all the time. So I'm not, too strict, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But when it comes to social media, there's, yeah. there, there's nothing, no reason they have to be on it. I don't mm-hmm. even put them on. You know, first of all, I don't know if a situation, so I don't want my kids being on social media. But secondly, it's not, you know, if they're not asking me or they don't know, why would I put them on there? You know, it's not fair to them. Because um, it is brutal. The social media is brutal. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I'm not... I'm not knocking anybody that that less the kids on there, you know, or let's let the kids have social media. I'm just saying, like, if you do let them have it, check it, you know, keep up on. Them. Like the one thing my daughter does have, she has that TikTok, hmm. and it's a private account, and we still on her, me and her mom, and we just go through it, you know, and make sure because, you, you know, you never know, mm-hmm. and. Uh, this shit will be, you know, come to an end or slow down a lot if more parents got involved on that. Then when something happens, though, 
you know, they're just, they're, you know, all crying and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think kids are just naturally curious, right? Like, especially on, on the internet, you could find anything. I think a lot of times kids are just curious and find things that they may not want to find, too. Exactly. And, and it's, it is crazy. Like, my kids are love, you know, they go to YouTube and they watch just good things on YouTube. But even even then, you know, it's, um, you still got to kind of control that because what are you, you know, what are you watching on there? Yeah. You know, you never know. Yeah, I say we go back to the flip flip phone days, right? We just have the <laughs> that flip phone, no no social media, <laughs> no text messaging. <laughs> yeah. So, Kylie, yeah. we're we're gonna do a couple of quick rounds uh, of best you've ever faced. So, I'm just gonna say a, a, a question, and you just throw out a name. So, who's the best fighter you've ever faced? Uh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to go ahead and say again. Uh, not my best night, but it's a close one. I'll, I'll say between Jermaine and, and uh, Bernard Hopkins. Awesome. Who's the best defensive fighter you? Sir, 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 Sergio is a close one. Sir- best <laughs> defensive fighter. Um, I know it's going to sound crazy, but that goes to Hopkins. Hopkins, uh, okay. Who's the best offensive fighter you you ever fought? I'd have to go ahead and say. Um, I'd definitely have to say Sergio. Sergio. Right, what was the most fun promotion uh, that you were involved in and about? Oh. Now, can I be shit that happened with other people on the card? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I, I would have to go ahead and say um, Edison Miranda because he he ran his mouth about me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we talk about how it's it's uh, it's always nice to have that opponent that uh, helps you sell that fight, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it did. And motivate you along the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. All right, what was the fight that was never made that you wish would have been made? Oh, man. I would have liked the Paul Williams. I would have liked Derek and Abraham. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I would probably say... I would say to Andre Ward. Andre Ward, yes. If I was supposed to fight him, yeah. um, and that was one of the big reasons behind retiring, mm. it was my last, my last fight. Um, there was talks to me, you know, we were in negotiation to fight, and uh, the contracts were getting ready to be signed, and uh, Andre Ward, that's when he hurts his shoulder, mm. and he had to get the surgery, and then there was nobody else really for me to fight, but any work, you know what I mean, because Super 6 was still going on. Mm-hmm. I was campaigning at 68, Mm-hmm. But, you know, a guy like Andre, I think he's another one that you could honestly put up there in the top 10. I mean, just the things that he done. And, you know, if I thought I would have won or, or, or win or lose, um, you want to fight the guys like Andre Ward in your career. Yeah, we actually had those two questions uh, sent into our, our Instagram. They asked us to ask you, how do you think a fight with Andre Ward would have turned out, in your opinion, and uh, how a fight with uh, Paul Williams would have turned out, uh, and, and your thoughts? Paul Williams, again, um, I, I respect Paul Williams, event, um, <clears throat> but I think that I would have been too much for Paul Williams. Um, I, I don't think that he would have, had, you know, even his punch out right, he, that was the biggest thing he had, but yeah. mine was every bit as much. Um, I was a knockout puncher, strong, and Paul Williams didn't have anything that would have kept me off of him. So I definitely think that I would have, if anything, I would have wore him down in the later rounds yeah. and probably stopped him. Nice. Martinez um, moment. What's that? A Martinez know, moment the... against Paul Williams. Oh, I, I honestly, I think it could have happened. I thought, I think for a fact, if, if Martinez did to him what he did, and I know it was a crazy punch, but you know, I definitely would have in the later rounds. Nice. Andre Ward, on the other hand, you got to be realistic. He was a bigger guy who fought at higher weight classes. He was sharp. Um, he was a, uh, he was a great fighter. Um, and uh, I don't know about that fight, to be honest with you. I'm not one of them guys that say, oh, I would beat him. Um, yeah. realistic. I bet you, I could tell you this, that would have been a fight. Yeah. We you had another one. Longer, yeah. We had another another question on Instagram from Mr. Alex Fernandez. Shout out to him. He was asking your favorite fight. Favorite fight, I would have to say, would have been the Miranda. It was probably the most painful, too. <laughs> because he did it. He hit you know, everything. He lived up to everything that his reputation was at the time. And, um, 
you know, he hit you with a jab if you carry that punch for a couple rounds. Okay, so but I'm it was fun because of how, how I fought him and, and how I pushed him back and just the way that fight went out was able to start this. And, and Bronco McCullough was fun because I, I had fun in that fight. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kaylee, uh, honestly, you can always say, you know, you've never, I, I, I think about that, uh, Ray Jim Bull, uh, Jake LaMotta scene where he says like, you didn't, you didn't knock me out, Ray. You can, you can say that no one ever took you out, out, you know, you're as tough as they come, um, out of Youngstown, not a whole lot of, uh, big name athletes come out of there, but you rep that, uh, your, your Youngstown, Ohio, uh, town with, with a lot of, uh, a lot of pride and, uh, I, people that, May not remember you we do acknowledge that, like how you changed the sport and uh, so my, my my question is was there a lot of pressure maybe being in the sport where uh it's it's probably uh most favorable to uh to to other races did you ever have that pressure of being the the the, the white hope yeah and you know and believe it or not it's true um it's the what do you call the reverse or whatever you want to um stereotype or whatever I remember the guy with HBO I think at the time it was uh, Greenberg or something like that who was running it and you know my agent goes why can't this is 2006 he goes why can't we get my guy on the big you know big networks and uh and premium television and he literally can't he goes because we don't invest from white guys from the midwest (laughs) that was word for word what he said they don't or, you know, the best I don't have. In other words, they're, they're not that good. And uh, that was that right there. So the pressure did come, you know, especially hometown. You got that pressure along carrying, you know, a city on your shoulders. And there's always, I'm not the only one, you know. So, you know, almost every fighter, so I'm sure, has that pressure, you know, especially when you start getting into the limelight and into the top five and everything else and you're on television. That pressure is there. Um, probably more so if you don't have a title because one loss can set you back yeah. and it's a long road back to the title getting close to a title shot but uh, yeah there was a lot of pressure I mean it was um, a lot of times it was overwhelming and some people handled it, handled it different than others for, for you when you became a, a, a champion uh, I saw that you were on the Joe Rogan podcast you said that your, your life changed overnight almost instantly with that world title can you tell me Elaborate a little bit more about that. Yeah, again, small town guy. Uh, you know, uh, out of nowhere. You know, you're you're pretty popular before the fight and everything, but when you win the world title, shit changes. And people tell you, hey, it's gonna change overnight, man. And you think, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but you don't know until it happens. And um, yeah, it was just crazy. Uh, people just come to your house; they don't care. You know, they come to your house. My, I was at my parents' house because they wanted to be at my house because of that. Mm. And they just knock on their door, you know, and, wow. hey, have them come out. We want to see them. You know, it was just like, you know, we, it's not bad. I mean, it, it's, you know, you're, you're a big time now. People want that. But I'd be with my family eating. And I'd have grease from chicken wings on my fingertips. And people ask for <laughs> autographs. And I'm handing them. They got to peel it off my fingertips. Uh you know, there's just a lot you get called on for a lot of things. And it was hard, you know, going to see sick kids. I remember one week I had to go see really um, terminally ill kids, and then I had to go see terminally ill hospice uh, elderly. And I had to go to a handicapped school, and I did that all in one week. And, man, that, that took a, a real big pounding on me. But, you know, and I love doing it, though. I've, I've always contributed to charities, and I have a charitable organization. That's going to be out soon, you know, the Kelly Public Terrible Organization. And, um, you know, so I, I like doing that. But a lot of things change. Yeah, you know, your, your friends, that's true, too. You know, you get buddies all around you. They all have great ideas, and they, but they need your help and this and that. Everybody wants to ride the coattail. And mm-hmm. then when you let go of them or get rid of them, you're, you're the uh, asshole, no good. Um and then that's the way it goes. So, what, what advice do you have for these fighters that are going through these things right now, where they're uh, getting that fame and that attention and that exposure, and all these new people are coming around? What exp- what advice do you have for these for these fighters? Again, on that, you know, I, well, I'll speak a lot for. I was fortunate. 
I had my dad. My dad was there. He was um, acted as manager. And if it wasn't for him, I probably would have been fighting until 2016 or 17 or 18. You know what I mean? Or I'd probably, oh, God knows where I'd be. But my dad was there to watch and always had um, the right people there with me for my money. And to this day, that's why I'm able to be able to do the things that I do and that I have. So I had, you know, I guess, long story short, try to surround yourself with somebody that you know is out for your best interest. And, you know, you're going to have friends. And listen, you fight and you train and you literally sweat. You're saying um, blood, sweat, and tears. Well, for a fighter, it really literally is blood, sweat, and tears. And a lot of people don't understand that, you know. So you want, if they want to go have fun, if they have friends, you know, but just keep an eye on who your friends and watch the motives of, of these guys, too. You know what I mean? That's the biggest thing I can suggest. And make sure you have a financial team behind you and uh, and, and a trustworthy financial team. And that you, whether it's a family member or or what, that's close, that watches uh, for the best for you. If you're going to go do something because you're a real champion, you think you can, where they're going to grab you and snatch you up and say, hey, listen, calm it the hell down, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Somebody that's out for the best interest. You don't need the, the yes people around you. Yeah, there you go. Well, Kelly, we got to wrap it up soon, but uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we would love for you to, to call in again. I know we, could, we there's lots of other things yeah. where we could talk about as well, um, and you could keep us updated on anything and everything that you're doing now uh, with your show. So uh, for those people that are tuning in right now, where can they follow you, and where can they, they follow your show? The punchline.live is the easiest to get to it. Um, again, I'll pull you up, and you can subscribe to either YouTube, Facebook, or you can try to YouTube um, The Punchline with Kelly Pavlik and James Dominguez. And then I just want to do one more thing, if you guys don't mind either. Yeah. Um, I got an app coming out, me and the kid from Youngstown, Billy Lau, who beat John Duddy and fought for world titles. Um, Billy Lau, uh, who is originally from Youngstown, he has a boxing gym in Naples, Florida. And we're doing a fitness app, and it's for, you know, me and him. So we have a world champion teaching boxing. It's also... His wife's a clinical nutritionist, and she's going to have a diet plan, nutrition plan, and recipes. And then his wife's cousin is a fitness guru, and she does the uh, functional train, uh, training, core workouts. So it's a whole fitness program with a diet plan. It's called the Sweet Science Plus. So check that out, guys. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kelly. Any final messages that you'd like to, to send out to your fans, people that know that you're going to be on here? Hey, uh, thank you guys for for the support over the years, and thanks for still supporting and uh, being a fan. I truly appreciate it. I want to thank you guys for having me on your show, and um, if you guys ever need anything, let me know. So, thank you, man. We appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to more conversations, and uh, looking forward to watching everything that you do. Thank, thank you, you man. I do appreciate it. Awesome, Kelly. We're going to link up your, your show uh, on, on our show so people can just clink and go directly to to your show, The Punchline. Oh, cool, man. Awesome. Right, well, that was Kelly Pavlik. Pav- Pav- thank you, Kelly. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kelly. We'll be in touch. Thank you, guys, man. Have a good one. Awesome. Yeah. Blessings. Blessings, Pat. All right, that was Kelly, Kelly the Pavlik. ghost. The ghost Pavlik. Yeah. And I, um, I feel like we could have talked about a lot more a stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot man. of stuff. But we'll have him back on, and yeah. we'll definitely ask definitely. him a bunch of other things that uh, that we weren't able to get to. But yeah, there's a lot, man. There's a lot to elaborate on. Yeah, it's something yeah. that he talked about is, uh, and the, the question that I asked him was there pressure, you know, him yeah. being a uh, of Caucasian, uh, you know, in a sport world do- where it's dominated by uh, Latinos and uh, you know other other races. And yeah, yeah, he said that. Yeah, he felt that that in in verse, uh uh, racism, I guess you can say, uh, yeah. where you know, just because he's a, a white uh, fighter, a lot of people think that he, he wasn't. Can't fight. He couldn't fight. And of course, you, s- you see his record. You see the names on it. What oh, is he, it? Forty and two. Four, Thirty-four knockouts. Exactly. Lots of knockouts. And he was. He had a entertaining style. Obviously, yes. if you see him, you see his look. You might think he's M- MMA fighter, but no, this guy could. That, this guy could could fight. You know what would have been like a dream matchup if if. Uh, 
Well, if the other guy would have, you know, uh, been a little more serious, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. against Kelly Pally. Around that time, yeah. Dude, that yeah. would have been fire. That would have been fireworks. Both guys can hit to the body. Mm -hmm. Both guys got power. Both guys can take a punch. Yep. That would have been a crazy yeah. fight. It would have been like phone booth season for the 160s, man, for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. but a lot of interesting stuff. And hopefully we get to a chance to talk to him again because, like you said, we could probably – we could have had like a three hour combo <laughs> and just everything kind of had to cut everything short a little bit, but yeah, interesting stuff, man. And going back to that thing, remember when we were talking about Kayla plant against uh, Mike Lee, I was mm -hmm. just intrigued that it was two white guys fighting. Yeah. Cause I was like, you don't even, you don't see this very often. Mm -hmm, exactly. Right? And that's the thing we, we didn't get to, to ask him like his thoughts on, on, on these fighters, you know, the Caleb plants, the, uh, the Nikita Bobby, Nikita Bobby. I like Nikita Bobby. Nikita Bobby. No, he, I like him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, his little entrances were, were a little bit like, oh, okay. But once once he gets in the ring, you know, he's all business. He's a yeah. he's a fighter, and he's stepping up his quality and opponents uh, as we go. And obviously, we're gonna see if he's ready for that. But uh, yeah, for sure, Kelly Pavlik has set has set the standard. You know, yeah, there. definitely. So, Before him, who else can you remember? Uh, an American of of European descent who mm. maybe won a title or even became top five. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure people, if you guys know, yeah, let comments, us know. Let us comments, know. Because uh, I can't remember at the moment. Because I, I go back. American. All yeah, right. American. Because I go back and I think of just like the Rocky Marcianos, like the <laughs> names that come out, right? And so in the 70s, you know, the 80s were, were dominated by, you know, the the, fi the Fabulous Four. And so I'm sure there's some names there, but not, not none stand out the way Kelly Pavlik did in the uh, late 90s, uh, 2000s. And so. Uh, I yeah. wonder if. But you would think that would help him, right? You would think. The fact that the majority of the people in the United States can relate to him, mm -hmm. right, in that sense. But he he's saying it kind of hurt him. You A heard the bit. stuff that they were saying in HBO behind the scenes yeah. about him. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting stuff. And we love to, you know, have a more in-depth combo yeah, on that. somewhere <laughs> along the line with Kelly Pavlik, man. That was interesting stuff. I'm going to check out his podcast for sure. I yeah. know you talked to me about it a little bit. Um, I'm going to check it out see what's up yeah awesome so do we have time geo or do we have to wrap it up soon we can we can talk like, about it a little, little bit, bit um you want to talk about the what do you want to start with the the fight card from last weekend or we could yeah let's talk about the fight card with last all right last so real week. quickly marcelino lopez 36 2 and 1 21 knockouts one again by knockout right do you remember this man no i don't marcelino. she kind of boxing posted the knockout on her page uh check it out on instagram wait he's Lopez, does that sound familiar? Is he the guy that knocked out somebody in the second round? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, I was That was the, him. I was looking at Lopez and I was like, I just remembered Lopez and Argentino, right? Yes. Marcelino I was Lopez. Like, I was like, that guy sounds familiar. And I was like, was that the same guy that knocked out Esther, our, our, our former guest? Yeah. Our guest Gano? from a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. He was the, the guy that kind of was telling us a story about being knocked out and not remembering anything for mm -hmm. the next... Uh, 20 minutes. You yeah. Know, I'm not talking about Johnny Gonzalez. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, because he told the same thing. I'm talking about Cano. Um, at, but it was that fight against Marcelino Lopez. Yeah. When I saw the name, I was like, that sounds like yeah. that one guy. When I saw him, I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. But he won by knockout again. He has a pretty good record. Uh, What is it? 36 and 2. Mm -hmm. So, and he's getting older, but he's still he's still fighting. He's like one of those fighters that are overlooked, but he's there. Yeah, he's but he's put, dangerous. He's dangerous. He put that yeah. grind in and he showed it. You know, with Kano now, he showed it this this weekend around. Yeah, it was a good card. Yeah. We had a uh, Hector Tanahara, mm -hmm. eighteen and zero now. And I mentioned five knockouts to you earlier. Yes, you right? did. Yeah, got to step that up. He's calling out Ryan Garcia. You know, but I think knockouts is the best way to 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 you know get that attention and exposure. Yeah. You want to yeah. call out these names? Yeah, he does have the same record as uh, Ryan, Ryan Garcia, yeah. eighteen and zero. But Ryan has 10 more knockouts. 10 more knockouts, and that, <laughs> so, that says a lot. Yeah. So he did call out Ryan Garcia, right, post-match. And I got it got some, I got the crowd going yeah. a little bit. Yeah, smart. Yeah, and I've, I've gone to RGB, and I've seen Tanahara. Yeah, he, he works hard. Talented kid. You're rocking the Virgil shirt? I am rock, yes, I am yeah, rocking yeah. the Virgil that shirt. That was a gift, right? It was, yeah. yeah shout out to Virgil yeah. Sr. and Virgil Jr. Yeah, but uh, we're going to see Tanahara. He's, he's, he can box. He can box. I think he can box. He can box. But five knockouts, that's, oh. oh, man. We'll talk to him. I don't know. <laughs> because <laughs> but, uh, he, he did mention at, uh, after the fight that he was a bit um 
not disappointed per se, but he was looking for the knockout. Mm -hmm. I think he hurt his opponent at the beginning of the fight, and he was looking for the knockout, but he didn't get it. So. Yeah. So that that would be an interesting fight down the road. So we'll see. Yeah, I think that will happen. That we're will we're happen. talking about it on the way here. There's a lot of potential, very good fights there. Yeah. Um, but that was Hector Tanahara. Shout out to him. Shout out to that Robert Garcia camp who was busy. Busy. Right, man. who was busy. Yeah. He also had Franco, right? Franco versus Negrete, yeah. round three, mm -hmm. right? Third fight. Third fight. And this is Legends versus RGBA, right? Because that's Manny Robles yes. on that corner. Robert versus Garcia against yeah. Manny Robles. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get to watch the full fight. I had to go somewhere, but uh, you want to talk about that one a little bit? You yeah. told me it was very close. I saw like the first three, four rounds. So it was a, it was a close fight again. It's what? This is the third fight. It's round 37. Yes, yes. And I, I've said this again. If they fight like... Well, round 31, I believe. 30, they were all 10, 10 rounders. rounders. There you go. Or round so, 21? 21. I'll go see. <laughs> but I, I just said, I've said it again. If they fight like... Yeah. That many times, <laughs> it's always going to be close. It's just one of those things that they're just... Their styles are just very close. Uh, yeah. I don't think either one has like that big punch that can make separate one from the other. Yeah. It's a very close fight. Uh it was ruled a, a, a split draw. Yeah. And, yeah, it was. It was very close, very competitive. Both both fighters having their moments. 96-94. Yeah. One for each, and then 95-95. Yeah, very spirit, spirited fight. I just feel like if they fight the same fight, it's always going to be close. <laughs> so they asked Franco after the fight, do you want yeah. that fight? He's all like, I think we're going to move on and stuff. And Shout out I, to Franco. Hopefully yeah. we can get him on the show. Yeah. Right, he's kept <laughs> in contact, contact with him. Yeah, and he, he said he wants to move on. and he's a, he's I don't blame he, him. <laughs> yeah, he's a young guy. He, he probably wants to move on. Negrete, he's a getting little bit, older. A little yeah. bit older. They asked him if he wanted it. He's all like, if I'm going to talk to my promoters, but if they want to do it again, yeah. he was yeah. more open for it. But I think it's time for these guys to mo move on to two other, two other <laughs> things. Yeah, and it was interesting because Chicano Boxing had an interview with Franco. And and I think with Negrete, too. I think you have yeah. some words with, with Negrete, Negrete, too. Yeah. And I think Negrete was saying he was looking for the knockout, right? Yeah. And Franco was like, he doesn't have the power to hurt me. Yeah. But he did hurt him. I think was it the second round a little bit so. when yeah, he stumbled yeah. him back? Stumbled a little bit. Yeah. yeah, but tough, tough. Yeah, tough. I, I'd move on, man. I'd be like, shit. <laughs> it's like fighting the mirror, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> man, just being at those, those two gyms, you're just like, ah, I can't live away. Like, yeah, true you, that. You get split when you, you get to meet, like, meet these fighters. Yeah. And again, it was uh, Manny Robles versus... Uh, uh robert garcia at the end you saw them taking pictures like hugging it out yeah. at the end of the day like you know it's all love but uh yeah man so it's Manny. crazy how much uh attention now manny robles is getting right, right. because of the whole andy reese thing everyone, yeah. everyone knows where he is now everyone know, knows his fighters and it's crazy it's yeah. cool man it's cool yeah the highs uh, and lows of boxing right? yeah right now they're on a high yeah We'll see how that fight happens, man. Yeah. They said it was official. Andy Reese is saying otherwise. We'll talk about it in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but so, Virgil Ortiz, the man on your shirt, uh, was relentless against relentless uh, Orozco. <laughs> yeah. Six round knockout. Impressive. Dude, it was. Impressive. And we've talked about this. Orozco was fighting a pretty good fight. He's fighting good, a pretty good fight. Uh, he was landing his shots, picking his shots. He was, like, pushing a, a – este, it's the Virgil Ortiz back, obviously not hurting his hurting, hurting him as much as yeah. Virgil was hurting him, but he was but still landing still competitive. Like because we mentioned last week, like most of the time Virgil doesn't get landed on, yeah. right? Like he, mm -hmm. he's a guy who goes in there and very good boxer takes care of business, right? Mm -hmm. But we we knew this was gonna be a tough fight for him. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, like you said, it Virgil was just <laughs> relentless <laughs> on, on Orozco and. You, what, what did you predict? You predicted uh, it was in, that it was going to be a little bit over Beyond time. the fifth. Beyond yeah, the I fifth. thought it was going to go like maybe eighth, ninth. Yeah. In the beginning, it seemed like it was going to go a little bit longer than yeah. the sixth because, yeah. like I said, Orozco was fighting a good fight, balance. He was going low, trying yeah. to land like <laughs> something uh, uh, up upstairs. And uh, Virgil was, I mean, he like you said, he was getting tagged. Obviously, he was taking the punch as well. But uh, yeah, he was and he was landing gr great punches on 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 Orozco. And Orozco seemed like he was taking them yeah. well. Yeah, they were they were affecting him, of course. But he had a good poker face and wasn't yeah. showing it until what round? The later rounds and yeah, yeah, this that six that six dude. round. I just saw Virgil go into a diff different gear. Yeah, he just and it was interesting because every time Orozco would go down. He just kind of like, he his head, yeah, right? he would like, shake ah. his head and like, God damn, he caught me again. Yeah. And then he would just like 
bang his gloves and like, all right, I'm ready to go. And then he'll get caught again. And it's just like, he's just like, yeah. damn, dude. Like he just seemed over overwhelmed a little bit by that power. Yeah. Crazy. I'm impressed. I yeah. think it was a statement. Yeah. No big time statement because what was that three knockdowns towards the end? And then you saw the ref just wave it off. He's like, no more. And it seemed like Orozco, like his, his fighting spirit would have wanted to continue. But yeah. That but it, would, it just wasn't his night. You could tell. Yeah. I think he would be the first one to admit that. But I think one of the knockdowns, I don't know if it was the when when he landed the uppercut, was that the second or third one? I believe it was the second. When uh, Virgil was kind of like off balance a little bit. He kind of tripped yeah, over yeah, Orozco's yeah, legs. Back. And mm-hmm. then right away he got in position and landed at uppercut. Yeah. And, yeah, Orozco just went down shook his head once again. It was <laughs> like, oh, damn. Man, that's – and we were in the gym and we talked about this, yeah. how, how Virgil, you know, at, at – 147 he was you know taking it to the bigger guys that he spars with yeah. and i was like man if he does this to these guys what is he gonna do to <laughs> Orozco? but Orozco came in in very good shape if he didn't you know that thing would not have gone six rounds but man virgil again cliche but sky's the limit with this kid yeah it really is man like you see his 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 ultra focus you know just being around his dad around his camp around his you know all those people are rgba he it's just focused, you know. It's he knows that what the what his end goal is, and he's not letting any distractions. And we we just had a Kelly, right? We talked about yeah. Kelly and how when that fame comes, like all these things, you know, just naturally come. All these extra people, but it seems like his dad and his his team have a tight. You tight got hold. cousins from like Puerto Rico. I'm like, dude, I've <laughs> never been to Puerto Rico. <laughs> Are you my cousin? <laughs> Man, <laughs> Shit, I didn't even know I was Puerto Rican. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. No wonder I like to get them. <laughs> <laughs> Been getting lineups for years. It makes sense. <laughs> Man, but yeah. Well, shout out to Puerto Rico, too. Shout Gone out to a lot of political stuff. For real. But they're getting together, though. Yeah. I saw a lot of the reggaeton artists, J-Lo, Ricky Martin, all them getting together. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And shout out to all the people from Grand Prairie, Texas, too. Oh, yeah, man. They showed Good up. Good turnout. Showed yes. up, yeah. Do you yeah. see that crowd? Ooh, they, yeah. were, they were on it. And, yeah. Virgil delivered. He did, uh, and he, you know, hands uh, Orozco his first knockout. And Chicana was talking about it, how this yeah. is an impressive win. He beat him more convincingly than did uh, Jose Ramirez his stable yes. man. He's the 140 champion who just unified that those titles yeah. uh, just last weekend over Maurice Hooker. Yeah, so kind of wants that smoke, Ramirez. So <laughs> 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 he's looking. He's knocking on your door. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's interesting. Uh, the prospects, right? Verge is what, 22, 21? 21. 21. You know, Ryan Garcia is what, 21? He just turned 21 as well, so. And Munguia is with 22. 22. And they'll be fighting yeah, September, September 14. 14 yep. Here. Here. Mm-hmm. Right around the corner. The Stub Hub Center. Hey. Or the Home Depot Center. <laughs> I'm not going to say the other one is too long. It's no, no. It's but a stub you, you, do you have any thoughts on that fight? That's going to be a... Uh, I mean, a lot of people are feeling some type of way, right? Because it's yeah. not the big name like Anello. But you know what? It's it's still a Mexican holiday. It's a Mexican yeah. fighter. So we're going to come out and support. Yeah, uh, I think people will turn out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they just need a reason to go out. Are you coming? <laughs> September 14th? Yeah. 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 Well, we'll put I'm going to be out of town. I'm going to be out in San Diego. So I was like, fuck, there's like a lot of stuff going on that weekend. But yeah. I'm going to tune in, though. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Fucking you're gonna, drive, you're gonna drive down to TJ maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Watch at a local bar in TJ. <laughs> real, get everything free in TJ, right? Munguia's like hometown. Yeah. Yeah, but Jaime Munguia's facing Patrick Alati. Jaime Munguia, 33 and 0, 26 KOs. Like we said, 22 years old. Patrick is a uh, 40 and 3, 30 KO. Sounds like a good record, but got to do more homework on that. Who's who has he been fighting? Yeah. Dude, Munguia was born in 1996. I don't think like he gets a lot of criticism. I feel like yeah, because people want him to be like that next guy, especially at that weight class, and knowing that he's probably gonna move up to 160. So a lot of people are like, "No, Canelo will fuck you up. Golovkin will fuck you up." But this guy's 22 he's, he's years old, young. man. He's very young. 1996. I mean, we I was in pre-K. Right. Remember <laughs> the first time we heard of Mungi, we knew about this prospect that was gonna fight Triple G, right? Yeah. Somebody pulled out. Yeah, and he was a kid. And we were just like, "Oh, hold on, chill." Like, yeah. you know, you're a prospect, but you're a prospect for you can't just go up to Triple G. And uh, he's had some tough fights. You know, he's gotten wins uh, the last couple of fights, but they've been pretty competitive, pretty close. Some of them controversial. Yeah, but the last I, one for sure. Again, he like you said, he's young. I think they need to chill a little bit. Yeah, and he's now training with Eric Morales. 
Yeah, and uh, <laughs> did you see the post with the uh, Chicana where yeah. they asked him? Uh, I think he meant uh, that <laughs> they were trying to make it seem like he said, "I've never watched an Eddie Morales fight." I think he meant live, like live. he didn't get the chance to watch yeah. it live. But you know how fans are; they just <laughs> like the headlines and they went off about it. I don't know. Let us know, Chicana. What do you think <laughs> in the comment section? I think he meant live. I've never watched the fight. Yeah, yeah uh, he's had to have watched some YouTube ones. He better go back and Morales watch Barrera, Morales yeah. Pacquiao. Shit, I Danny Garcia Morales. Don't yeah, watch that don't one. Don't watch but. that one. <laughs> <laughs> but Start, it's out there. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, we're going to be there. We're going to come support. We're going to see if we can make a statement because yeah. the last couple of fights, again, like we said, have mm-hmm. been very competitive. Some of them controversial. Yeah. So, yeah. And these people need a show, man. And Stub Hub needs to get that Carson, energy California, back. California, LA, man. whatever you want to call it, they need a show. They need a show. Last time we had who? Uh, Ray Vargas against Tomoki Kameda, and people weren't happy. They were happy with Kameda, for, but they weren't happy yeah, with... Yeah, they weren't happy with the way Vargas. And Vargas, most of them were Mexicans, man. They were not Japanese people. <laughs> Trust. <laughs> but so also on the undercard, Ryan Garcia against Avery Sparrow. That one's going to be good. 18-0, Ryan Garcia, 15 knockouts. Avery, 10-1, three knockouts. Avery um, with uh, Usher in his corner, right? Was Usher? that him? Yeah, that was Usher. I saw, saw some videos, but I didn't know that was him. <laughs> Yeah, I think De La Hoya was all like... If he can move like Usher in the, in the <laughs> ring, he's got a chance. <laughs> or if he can move like a sparrow. <laughs> but yeah. Should be good, man. Should be good. Yeah. That's here. Like I said, uh, StubHub Center. Check it out. Um, But we also had the same evening. <laughs> the one and only. There's only one Tyson Fury. Yep. That- Tyson Fury against Otto Whalen. Las Vegas, Nevada. This one's at the T-Mobile, right? T-Mobile Arena, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do oh. you think about that one? Dude, <laughs> you saw the poll on Instagram, right? The one with the, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so only us two voted thumbs up. Everybody else thumbs down, <laughs> dude. The vast majority of you guys are not happy with this fight. Let us know why. What do, yeah. you, what do you think? I think it's because nobody knows who his opponent is, yeah. maybe, right? And yeah. maybe, maybe they're not happy with... Uh, uh, a British fighter fighting on, on Mexico Independence okay. Day, but I mean it's Tyson. If you know Tyson, he's entertaining. He's gonna try to yeah. you know he's gonna bring come you out show. to Mexican music perhaps. Yeah, maybe with that hat, maybe some uh, Mayweather sombrero. Oh, you never know. Would Ooh. you be offended by that or not, or would you be like it's Tyson? I think coming from Tyson, I wouldn't be offended. Right. Yeah. Because he's a showman. Yeah. You kind of expect it. You, you expect you can expect anything from Tyson. Yeah. Right. If it's another guy, like when I when we saw Errol Spencer the sombrero, I'm like, nah, take that shit off, yo. <laughs> it wasn't as offensive <laughs> as when Mayweather brought it out, but yeah. still it was like. But it's uh, like you're fighting a Mexican fighter. Why are you wearing his colors and his hat? <laughs> <laughs> Give that shit back to him, bro. <laughs> like, yeah. Mikey was in the back. Hey, <laughs> <me> sombrero? <laughs> Pita. Where's my sombrero? <laughs> yeah, one job. <laughs> Hey, Robert. <laughs> <Come here. laughs> Man, so maybe that was it. He maybe was worried it. about the sombrero the whole fight. And Probably. Well. That's <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't focused. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with Tyson, uh, I expect him to have a really a really uh, Mexican-themed entrance. And yeah, I, yeah, you're right, dude. I can't be mad at him. You, we can't be mad. I mean, the people that know who he is, how he is. And make it entertaining, dude. I don't, yeah. l- like, even with jokes, I don't, like, a lot of people get offended by certain jokes, but I'm like, if it's funny, mm-hmm. I'm going to laugh. Like, yeah. You know, just like this. Be entertaining. Yeah. Be entertaining, and I'm going to be like, cool, that, that's cool, but. It's a Mexican yeah. trunks, man. <laughs> <laughs> we know a guy, man. Come out with a luchador mask or something. Dude, Mexican. that shit would be oh, funny. Hit me up if you need that. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> we got one from Halloween. Just got <laughs> gotta <laughs> give it back by October 30th, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we got. <laughs> For real. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to wrap it up quickly. So, you want to talk about the press conference a little bit? Yeah. Press Shout out conference. to everyone who's there. Shout out to Alex Fernandez, Chicken on Boxing. You guys can check out some stuff on their Instagrams and YouTubes. Yeah. As so, well. so, it was a press conference at the Staples Center for the uh, Showtime Sean Porter versus Errol Spence Jr. fight. Man, it was. We knew it wasn't going to be a whole lot of people. I mean, yeah, it was uh, a yeah. Wednesday. A yeah. lot of people were at work. I couldn't even make it. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it was it was still fun. It was still intimate. It was hot as fuck. Ain't going to lie. So maybe that's what. It's been what hot this week. It's been hot this week. But, uh, yeah, dude, it's a stack card. Stack card with uh, David Benavides and uh, on Anthony Durrell. Pandera Roja. Pandera Roja. Shout out to him. <laughs> Interviews on our channel. Yeah. Cool, dude. Yeah, and also uh, John Medina Jr. contra Josecito Lopez. Ooh, Riverside I like it. Rocky. That's a good fight. I like it. That's a good fight. 
And yeah, man, it's gonna be a stack card. Other other names on that at fight: uh, Robert the Ghost, the other Ghost, Ooh. coming back. And you said it, you look fresh, and he Ooh. did. Yep. He looked energetic. Yeah, of course. After you, you've been, you know, with those big fights. You're in the smaller fights. You might. We saw him out, but he seemed energetic, positive, happy. Yeah, his dad. Yeah. You know, I like that. They exude that energy, and so I, uh, I think he's gonna he's gonna make a little run for it here in the welterweight division. That's what he, he wants, wants to do. That's what him and his dad were talking about, and uh, Robert was talking about. Uh, just going back to boxing yeah. right instead of being a a slugger, a slugger. against these big guys yeah. so we'll see we'll see what he can do in yeah. staples center that that evening yeah and that's what he did in the lower weight classes brought him a lot of success so yeah 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 honestly fun fun card uh i know you saw the energy that uh sean porter was bringing yes that was good Showtime. Yeah. Time is it. <laughs> and of course you saw errol spence with that like oh he looks on, he looks like he's on uh, lean all, he's, all the time and he's I was just there, like uh, yeah. And I was talking to Jakana. I was like, okay, I get it. You're maybe ultra confident, cause yeah, I mean, you're you're up there. You're, you're probably top two. But we talk about marketing though. Yes, yeah, so we time. talked about this. I was like, okay, I, I get did. it. You're ultra confident. You're. I'm pretty sure you know you could beat Porter, like in your mind's eye. But dude, you still have to <laughs> exude some kind of like energy. Get get the people like get the people going. Yeah. Like, or if you if you don't want to, all right, it's cool. You don't want to do it. But just look at Sean Porter and be like. Dude, sit your ass down. Yeah, and then everybody's gonna laugh and think you're <laughs> you're this funny guy. Yeah, you don't have to be all <laughs> like energetic. And I, I know he said it, uh, because it was the crowd was pretty mellow up until Sean yeah. got up and he's all yeah. like, "Nah, y'all too quiet." I'm bringing like he started bringing this energy, <laughs> yeah. which was contagious. And that I feel like that kind of gave uh, Arrow a little bit of pressure to get some energy. The first thing he said is like, "I'm not gonna give you guys yes. kind of energy, but I'm gonna give you a fight." And I was like, "All right, I see you." Just tell him. Save your energy for the fight, Sean. Yeah, something, something, something clever. Something. something clever. You don't have to be all like... Duh, 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 duh. Damn, but yeah, you're a professional entertainer. Yeah. Do, yeah, do some clever wits. You know who I like who's entertaining? Who's going to be on that card too? Uh, Joey Spence. Yeah. All right. So up, Spence yeah. and Spencer. Well, Spencer, right? Is his last yeah, name. Yeah, Joey Spencer. S- Joey Spencer, yeah. yeah. So Spencer and Spencer. Punch. Yeah, he's good. He's like 6 and old, something like that. Yeah. 7 old. Young guy. Yeah. Another... Uh, American of European descent. There you go. Well, maybe yeah. he's the next one. Maybe he's the one. <laughs> Is he the one? Yeah, but he, he's fun to watch. Yeah, that guy can punch. Uh, yeah, at, at, I was talking uh, to Lily when we were out there, and they were doing little introductions, and a lot of them seemed very mellow, and it's just yeah. like, yeah, you guys gotta, you guys gotta give us more. I mean, yeah, do a little. Dude. Yeah, you gotta. I watched the videos, and everyone was going up there for thirty seconds, and then sitting back down, and I was like, yeah, y'all need some PR people or some communications classes some speech classes just go up there and I i'm know, telling man. you i've uh if, if broner is you know serious about retirement he can show them how to do this it takes he can a, be the host for the these <laughs> events <laughs> he imagine could, that dude, pbc imagine. hired adrian broner <laughs> as the host of these events people will show out to these press conferences yeah. just for adrian broner yeah. trust me um coming up next <laughs> Get get up here, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, because uh, yeah, he he has that. Uh, it takes it back to that time where they were doing the PBC unveiling of the fighters. Yes, and yes. all these guys seem very like monotone. Like all right, it's just seemed I like don't know just, what it is. Man. And something about Broner, he was just like, he's like, man, I don't Chilling. like none of y'all. Like <laughs> as much as you dislike what he does inside the ring and then outside, you know, in his extracurricular, he is he can entertain. Yeah, and oh, man. some of these guys need to pick up. That from him, not yeah. everything else, but just like the entertaining factor. Of yeah. course, still be yourself. Find yeah. a way to still be yourself, yeah. but in a in an entertaining like fashion. But tell a front a funny friend to write some jokes to you or something. <laughs> you know, for real. But I mean, you like Carlos Mencia, you know? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but other than that, is a stat card, man. Stat card. Uh, again, I'm I'm after interviewing uh Sean Porter. I'm. I can. I, he's gonna make it a tough fight. Yeah, he's gonna make it a tough fight. I'm still thinking about fight. my my uh, prediction for this fight. Really? Yeah. See, yeah, yeah, something I've noticed. I'm like, I'm not gonna go straight for, because again, you get sometimes surprised anything can happen in boxing. The same thing that happened with Jean Pascal. I had, I think I written yes. him off a couple weeks back, and then he does this, and I was like, sure, it was controversial, close, yeah. but he's the champ. I think he's Sean a- can make it close enough to. They're gonna be like, hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. hmm. Some judges are. I think they're gonna be like, okay, yeah. Think about this one, you know. Yeah. But that's that Staples Center, September 28th, uh, Fox pay-per-view. We'll see how it does. We'll see yeah. how it does. Both guys, obviously, there aren't big names like that, mm-hmm. right? In the last pay-per-view for, for uh, Fox, they had Manny Pacquiao. 
yeah right and keith thurman so we'll see what they can do but uh, i'm excited for that uh bandera roja fight yeah. against anthony durrell that that's gonna be good. good that one's gonna be good man Jay. durrell with experience uh benavidez with the youth and he said he wants his title back so and lily asked some some interesting stuff about the banned substances yeah. uh, so check it out on her channel um i'll link it up yeah man check out those videos guys some stuff that you guys would want to check out because yeah there's some stuff that yeah. goes outside the ropes that yeah yeah and uh bank of california home of, uh, home of the lafc mm -hmm. uh this saturday right yeah top rank card top rank card now at there you'll be there Banca. i'll be there credential approved so we'll be back there yeah making those contacts getting close and personal with these uh with these fighters so man we're the first ever boxing fight at the LAFC yeah. in California. Yep. So something about that stadium, anybody who's been there, who's been out here on the West Coast, that's a any seat is a good seat. Yep. Those those seeds go inwards up and so even Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm yeah, I'm excited to see like those though Bro, you gotta are you gonna go? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I don't mind watch on TV. I gotta <laughs> I hate that like <laughs> traffic, man, I swear. Get there early, man. Get there early. <laughs> But yeah, man, I like to get some footage of those, like from that. From I'm that. like Al Heyman, dude. You're not, you're never gonna see me at these shows. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna send you and Chris. I'm just. Stay you're, home. The, you're the you're the <laughs> you're the fourth ghost, then, huh? Right. Yeah, send me the videos. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow they'll make it up on YouTube. <laughs> drop 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 the SIM card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the lab. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's gonna be a, a good card. Can't wait to to see the inaugural. Yeah, know, and fight. can't wait to see it if uh, LAFC fans are gonna come out there. Yeah, you know. See, if PBC was smart, they'll give them tickets. Right. 100, 200 people. Yeah. And they'll have that shit fucking exactly. environment mm -hmm. turning up. Again, LAFC, they have money coming in with all these investors and owners. And so yeah. it's a smart partnership if they can, uh, you know, take advantage of that. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, and we will have uh, more time to talk about what happens in that show. Uh, anything else you want to promote? Uh, maybe that. Oh, Talk about yes, Andy What's Ruiz up? making that announcement oh, that yeah, yeah. this fight is not happening in Saudi Arabia. So this was through Instagram, right? Instagram, Instagram Live. Yes, Instagram Live. And what did he say? So we were wondering, right, why he hadn't yeah. put the official picture. They said it was official, and, no, and nobody, nobody from Andy Ruiz's camp. I even saw an interview with uh, Manny Robles. Yeah. And they were asking him, "What's up?" And he's just like, "You know what? I don't have a say in this. Mm -hmm. This was from this past weekend at, at his at his event." Um, and he was like, "I don't have a say in this." why are they not replying i don't know but basically uh i'm the trainer so yeah and then so yeah that's what caught our attention like why aren't you guys promoting it why isn't has why hasn't it gone and it's because they don't agree yet and it's interesting right? either that or they're trolling the media <laughs> Some, something <laughs> but uh yeah andy went live and said no we haven't you know decided to do this in saudi arabia he said he his words exactly he's like i have no protection out there He's like, I, I don't feel protected out there. So, again, we've talked about the stuff that's gone on with Dealing and Why, with BBC. This is technically, you know, Saudi Arabia, so should should be considered neutral. We know, we talked about it in our last episode, it's that's do with the money, right? The money that they're going to pay to to host this event. But, yeah, Andy's not happy. He said, nope, it's coming back to the U.S. Hmm. But as Lily Chicana Boxing explained uh, last week, this is just an extension of uh, the first fight, yeah. you know, and I, Eddie Hearn went on and said, like, the exact same thing. Yeah. That he has a, um, a duty as a man, you know, once he signed <laughs> that contract, that first yeah. time, which, which he pretty much said, like, we gave you a chance. Yeah. We honored the first contract, now mm -hmm. let's honor the second one. Yep. He's all like, we're going to respect you as a champ because, you know, you did win. See, and but people are like, no, it should be under Andy's terms. He's the champion now, <sighs> but you're still not the A-side. Yeah, I'm sorry to break it down like this, but and Roger Mayweather, right? You don't know. <laughs> yeah, Roger Mayweather, my favorite quote in boxing. <laughs> but uh, Reese, I mean, I'm sorry, Anthony Joshua is still the A side, mm -hmm. regardless of what people want to think. Um, and like Willie said, I'm pretty sure it is an extension of that first contract. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned last week that I think Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua are being pretty respectful in that sense, mm -hmm. where they're not forcing them. Right, it doesn't seem like they're forcing them. All right, yeah. it's gonna be in Cardiff, Wales, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Right, they're kind of weighing the options, and and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think in his, in uh, Eddie Hearn's uh, mind's eye, 
what he said, like we had to respect him as a champion. I think yeah. Saudi Arabia was that uh, meeting you in the middle type, right? Yeah, we're going to the middle middle of the desert, literally. <laughs> <laughs> we're going, we're giving you the Creed treatment. Go back to to the <laughs> desert. <laughs> yeah, but man, we'll see what happens, man. Uh, he seemed, yeah, he hasn't promoted this on his Instagram, man. He either man, he's just a coach. Were, were his words? Uh, yeah. So we'll see what what happens. But now. this is a good build up to the fight, regardless. Yeah. We're talking about it now, yeah. right? People are having a lot of assumptions and anticipations, and and we'll see what happens, man. But I think it's a good build up toward that fight right now. Everybody's like, "What's gonna happen? Is it really gonna be in Saudi Arabia? Mm-hmm. Is Andy gonna, you know?" I don't know what people yeah. think Andy could do, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like, what can he do? Uh, again, if he signed, he signed. and Yeah, it's all just his word, like, but they can just show him and write yeah. him. That, I'm We're pretty, assuming, right? I'm pretty sure he's going to get a, he if he hasn't already, ha- he has a lawyer to look over these documents. But, I mean, yeah. it's going to be a tough one to battle. Yeah. But, I mean, hopefully it just happens. I just want it to happen already. Yeah. As yeah. a boxing fan, you just want to see these fights. I couldn't care less yeah. where it is. I just want to see him fight again. Mm-hmm. I don't care. It just seems like Eddie has to give him uh, that peace of mind. Or it's give him a piece of the cake, too. <laughs> a bigger piece of the cake. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said something like uh, that. Something about the money where he... Does he deserve more money? He said, absolutely not, or some shit like that. Like, he deserves a, a, a rematch. Yes, of course. Like, But does he deserve, like, a... Big, he said, absolutely not. I'm like, mm. Uh, it, just seeing <laughs> that, try to try yeah. to make the champion happy, give him yeah. a little bit more, you know. But that also frust- frustrates me from quote unquote boxing fans because they're like, oh, this guy should get fifty percent, or like they always say that in big fights. It's like, no, if you're bringing in ten percent of the fans, why do you deserve fifty percent? Like mm. mathematically, that this shit doesn't even make sense. Yeah, I don't know. I for sure, I know if it was in the U.S., Andy would bring in a lot more fans than he did the yeah. first time around. If right? I'm running a business and I'm fucking doing 60% of the work and you're doing 10, yeah. guess what I'm going to give you? I'm going to give you 10. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is matchroom boxing, right? It is them doing all the promotion on that end. So, uh, yeah, tune in next week and see what uh, new yeah. developments have have surfaced. Yeah. But yeah. I think that's it for episode 50. Uh, our anniversary is coming up. Anniversary 52. All right, September. Maybe in a month, right? Somewhere. Yeah, two August weeks from 14th. Now. Next week, two weeks. Yeah. Um, we're going to try to get in a lot of guests, right? We want to thank Kelly Pavlik for the good conversation. Uh, looking forward to more. Collabs, yeah. Yeah. Bringing more guests in. If you guys uh, have anybody that you would want us to reach out, like drop the comments on the uh, down down here. And yeah. Yeah. And we, I think we're going to start doing that, right? Yeah. We've been having talks like just fucking inviting people to come. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. We've had reporters, female mm-hmm. and male. Mm-hmm. We've had up and comers. We've had veterans right yeah we've had random people show up like oh shit what's up right yeah. people bring friends right there you go yeah <laughs> we uh, have a dig <laughs> <laughs> take care <laughs> um yeah so if anybody would like to come on the podcast just set us up yeah we right? have we're fall. open to to anybody um uh, we've reached out to a few people so we're gonna have a couple people coming up right in the, mm-hmm. in the fall but yeah. other than that we're pretty pretty lenient right yeah. it's most of the time we get a guest like the week of yeah we're just like yo you want to come on cool yeah yeah all right come on talk about your career we have a conversation it's just it just flows yeah and so anything you guys want to you know promote you know just hit us up and we'll we'll figure that out from there but yeah fall season is now open and yep yeah don't forget to follow us at Against DA Ropes, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, all that stuff. Against the Ropes dot online, the website. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've had a lot of uh, content coming up lately, right? Yeah. A lot of stuff, man. Yeah. A lot of stuff and a lot of other stuff to come. So make sure to stay tuned, man. Yeah, that's it. We out. So 50. Oh, wait, hold up. Hold I got up. a good way to. Do I have it on this song? 50. Something with 50? Hashtag 50. 50. <laughs> no, I've been working on like outros and shit. Mm. Um. Follow us at Against DA Ropes on all <laughs> social network platforms. Thank you. We out. We out. <laughs> we out. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> we out.